All right. Good afternoon. I have some... Uh, no need to rush, James. I can always delay the briefing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good afternoon. Um, uh, some travel to announce, which is uh, will not come uh, as being unexpected. The Secretary General will be going to Berlin to take part in the Libya conference on Sunday. That conference is being hosted by German Chancellor Angela Merkel. He will be accompanied by his special representative for Libya, Kassam Salame, as well as the Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, Rosemary De Carlo. The Secretary General will be back in New York on Monday night. However, as a result of uh, this travel, we've had to rejigger the Secretary General's schedule, uh, and the press conference, which had been scheduled for uh, next week, will now take place to, on 28 January. This afternoon, the Secretary General will be uh, at the handover of the chairmanship of the Group of 77, and that takes place at 3 p.m. this afternoon. Guyana will take over the rotating chairmanship of the group this year, replacing Palestine. In his remarks, the Secretary General is to say that the G77 has played a pivotal role in shaping priorities and driving change. He will also say that he's deeply grateful, in particular, for the group's support for the first annual budget and the ongoing reform efforts. The Secretary General will also discuss the reform process, the decade of action to deliver on the sustainable development goals and our wider agenda, and the UN budget. We will share those remarks with you as soon as we can. Um, back in the Security Council this morning, the head of the UN's peace operations, Jean-Pierre Lacroix, reiterated our concern about the deteriorating security situation in uh, Mali and the Sahel. He said that terrorism continues to feed intercommunal violence in the center of Mali and repeated that the rapid and thorough implementation of the peace agreement remains the only viable path for the stabilization of the country. Mr. Lacroix called for additional resources to ensure the mission is able to effectively fulfill its mandate in the country's center and north. He said the mission has developed a plan that calls, among other things, for the establishment of a mobile task force to improve its ability and mobility to protect civilians and implement the mandate. Um, Mr. Lacroix reminded council members that the UN's mission in Mali is only one element of a broader collective response to fight violence and instability in Mali and the wider Sahel. Turning to the Central African Republic, following clashes last week in the city of Alindao, uh, the UN peacekeepers are now patrolling the city to protect civilians, including some 400 people displaced by violence who have sought shelter at the UN base. <clears throat> the clashes took place on January 9th and involved the country's armed forces and members of an armed group associated with the Exelica coalition. Uh, two uh, personnel from the Central African Republic's armed forces uh, died in the violence. Today, the UN mission says that the situation is calm despite continuing tensions. They are preparing to send a team uh, to Alindao, consisting of police, human rights, justice, and prison officers to investigate the, the clashes. Meanwhile, we also have an update on efforts to secure Bangui's PK-5 neighborhood. The mission says that all 13 bases of the ex-self-defense groups that have been dismantled and UN peacekeepers, um, saying, the mission says that all 13 bases of the ex-self-defense groups have now been dismantled. UN peacekeepers continue to conduct joint patrols with the Central African Republic's internal security forces to protect civilians. The mission has also launched an awareness campaign in the PK-5 neighborhood to explain the community, uh, to the community its outreach and work to protect civilians. Our colleagues at the UN country team in Kenya today voiced their deep distress at the rising cases of terrorist attacks on schools, teachers, and students, especially in the northeast of the country, noting that the bombings of schools and the killings of civilians violates international humanitarian law. The team says it's especially troubling that the regions most affected by these attacks are already lagging behind schools' attendance rates. The UN in Kenya is determined to work with the government to implement the UN's global counter-terrorism strategy. And turning to Syria, I want to say that we remain deeply concerned for the safety and protection of over 3 million civilians in Idlib and surrounding areas in northwest of the country, over half of whom are internally displaced following new reports of airstrikes and shelling. 
Despite the announcement of a ceasefire that began on January 12th, there were reports today of airstrikes and shelling impacting civilians in various parts of Idlib, including airstrikes on Idlib City, reportedly killing 15 people and injuring scores. Civilian infrastructure also reportedly damaged. Tens of families have, report, have reportedly moved through the so-called corridors announced by the Russian Federation on January 13th for civilians who want to move through areas under control of the government of Syria. The UN urges all parties and those with influence over those parties to ensure the protection of civilians and civilian infrastructure in line with their obligations under international humanitarian law. And just a quick update from uh, the Philippines and our colleagues at the Office for the Human Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Uh, and they are telling us that Philippine authorities are review reviewing contingency plans having to deal with the ongoing situation with Tal Volcano. And they have asked several UN agencies, including OCHA, the World Food Program, the World Health Organization, and the Food and Agricultural Organization for their support. And we will obviously do what we can to help. Um, tomorrow, my guest will be Elliot Harris, the UN Chief Economist and Assistant Secretary General for Economic Development, along with Don Holland, the Chief of Global Economic Monitoring Branch in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. They will be here to brief you on the launch of the World Economic Situation Prospect Report 2020 edition, which is under embargo until that time. And we are delighted to bring, uh, to welcome two new members to this year's honor roll, and those are Djibouti and Luxembourg. We thank them uh, heartily for their paying their budget dues on time and in full, which brings us up to how many members of the honor roll? Very good. I think if we keep into the two digits, we can all keep up. But we hope that will not last uh, long. Bitul. Um, thank you, Steph. Uh, four of my colleagues uh, in Egypt have been detained in a police raid today from an Adolay agency. Their passports and phones have been seized, and their whereabouts are still unknown. Uh, do you have anything to say on that? And also another question on Libya. Uh, has the invitation for Libya talks been extended to the Libyan parties? Will Mr. Saraj and General Haftar uh, attend the talks in Berlin? Uh, on your first question, I had not seen those reports. I will uh, look into them. Uh, we're obviously always very concerned in any reports of arrest or detention of uh, journalists, but we will look into it. Uh, as, far as, the invit as far as the Berlin conference, uh, the German uh, government is issuing the invitations. Uh, James. A follow-up then on, on Libya. Clearly, this follows, I mean, I, I know it has a different aim, which is part of um, uh, Special Representative Salami's plan. But this follows from the Moscow talks mm -hmm. um, between, um, uh, uh, well, with, with, with Siraj and Hafter there. Only one of those parties is currently signed. What is the Secretary General's message to General Hafter in the days leading up to Berlin? The Secretary's me message to all the Libyan parties is to abide by a ceasefire to stop the fighting and recommit to a political process. I have another question on a different matter, if I can. Mm -hmm. Why not? Um, we had an interesting news conference from the head of Human Rights mm -hmm. Watch, Ken Roth, um, uh, in the last 24 hours. In that news conference, he raised a long-standing issue, um, which is the um, database that the High Commissioner for Human Rights mm -hmm. was supposed to come up with, detailing the companies doing business with mm -hmm. Israeli settlements. Uh, and he said that had been, sit had been completed and was sitting on the High Commissioner's desk and had been for 15 months. And he speculated that it was the SG worried about retaliation from Trump. And he said if the SG wanted, he could get that released tomorrow. That, that Can you tell us about about why that database has been published and does the Secretary General want something that the Human Rights Council has requested to be published? Uh, that is a question for the Human Rights High Commissioner. The high, uh, Human Rights Council mandated the High Commissioner to uh, publish such a 
such a database. Um, and I will leave it at that. Does the Secretary General have any problem with it being published? No. We are given a mandate by uh, the Human Rights uh, Council, and uh, it's, a, it's a question referred to the High Commissioner. Yes, Edie, and then we'll go to the back. As, as a follow-up to um, Ken Roth's um, both press conference and the report that Human Rights Watch issued, um, the report was critical of the Secretary General saying that he had not spoken out on China's um, activities against the Uyghur Muslim minority in Xinjiang. What's your response to this that? This is, uh, so Mr. we were delighted that Mr. Roth chose the UN to launch his report. Um, uh, and we welcome everybody into this building. Um, I think some of you may recall, we have answered that question and we have spoken out on this issue. The Secretary General himself uh, last year on a number of occasions uh, raised a number of issues with his Chinese counterparts, including the situation in Xinjiang. This, um, I think the last time was on the sidelines of the ASEAN uh, meeting. He has done it uh, earlier in 2019 when he was in, um, in Beijing. And his position uh, and his message is the same in, in public and in private, uh, which is based on three principles, a full respect for the unity and territorial integrity of China, condemnation of terrorist attacks, and uh, that human rights must be fully respected in the fight against terrorism and the prevention of violent extremism. Each community must feel that its identity is respected and it is fully belongs to the nation as a whole. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, about Syria, it's now a few days after the UN Security Council compromised on the cross-border resolution. And uh, officials have uh, expressed concern that 1.4 million could be cut out of eight. Mm -hmm. So now, after a few days, I'm wondering if you have any information how dire the situation on the ground in northeast Syria actually is. Well, I mean, I think I've just outlined our concerns with the situation in northeast just at the start of this uh, this briefing, given the challenging humanitarian situation, the ongoing reports of shelling uh, and attacks uh, and the, the suffering of, uh, of the Syrian people themselves. Um, the Security Council passed the resolution on Friday. We took note of it. Uh, we are now adapting our uh, operations uh, to be in line, obviously, with the mandate given to us. Um, it is clear that uh, the, this pauses, this will cause operational challenges to us, but we will try to meet uh, those challenges and do whatever we can uh, for the um, uh, to meet the needs of the Syrian people. But you don't have any information right now how it developed after Friday evening? No, and I'm, uh, our colleagues at OCHA are, are working on something for us on that. Okay. Thank you all, except for James, who clearly wants to ask one more. Yeah. Uh, we welcome everyone to this building. I'm going back to some questions I asked months ago, actually. I don't think I ever got an answer on what the current policy was for officials from Taiwan who wanted to come in this building. Um, so are officials from Taiwan welcome to come in this uh, building to brief us at any point? I, the requirements for people to come into this building to show documentation from one of 193 member states remains the same. No, but actually, that was the question, and, and I know Farhan took it away and it never came back. <laughs> the, the officials, <laughs> officials from Taiwan say that they were allowed to show other forms of identification to come in this building in the past, and the rules have been strengthened or, or, or is made, the bar has been raised in recent years? The, the, the rule uh, stands as it is today. Well, Thank can, you. Can we, can we see the rule, please? What, what, is that exactly what the we rule is? We can try. Maria. Thank you. Um, on Russia, uh, President Vladimir Putin announced today some possible changes in Russian constitution, and one of them is that uh, in case if some international decisions contradict Russian internal interests, Russia can, 
if these changes will be adopted, Russia will be able not to um, uh, not to accept these decisions. Uh, do you have any comments? No. On let, this? let me take a look exactly what was said, and I'll come back to you. Yes, sir. Um, and then we'll go to the back. One of the things that Human Rights Watch was critical of the SG for was sending its top counterterrorism official to Xinjiang. Um, and I just wanted to clarify whether or not the Secretary General views the Strike Hard campaign, um, which is what's happening in Xinjiang, as a form of counterterrorism. Is this counterterrorism or is this something else? I, I would refer to you to what we said at the time on this. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Samia Salek with Indoor Press Service. Going back to uh, the Human Rights Watch report, um, Ken Roth also very explicitly said that at the UN, a major Chinese government priority has been avoiding the conversation on Xinjiang. And I just wanted to see if, if that's uh, a statement that the Security uh, Secretary General's office acknowledges or agrees with. Well, you know, that's, I think that's a question left for uh, observers uh, and analysts to comment on the policy, you know, the strategy of one member state at the UN. It's not for us to comment. Madam. Uh, thank you. Um, with regard to Iran and the three European countries that have triggered this dispute mechanism, I was wondering if there's any update as to whether the SG's office has been approached and whether... No, I'm not aware that we've been officially involved. approached. Uh, the way, as I understand it, that the, uh, the dispute mechanism uh, does not directly involve the, the Secretary General. So, but we're aware, obviously. Thank you.